Life's pretty simple on the mountain. It's really back to basics. You have to concentrate on one thing at a time. In many ways, coming back from Everest is the hard part. The demand for all sorts of things has just been so high, from uh, presentations to, to children and charities and corporations and appearances all over the place. Super, ready to roll? Right on. <sighs> Prior to, to going to presentations, there's always the, the customization that Dave does. And that's something that we do together. I kind of sit back and participate as an audience member, give him my opinion on, yeah, I think that story fits, no, that doesn't fit. With Dave, we are very connected, not only in a relationship sense, but also business-wise. I think that it's very important as a couple for me to be involved in his work because it's such a huge part of our lives. Well, David was mischief personified. Oh, he was perpetual motion. Full of enthusiasm. He did everything with a lot of gusto, even from an early age. Inquisitive. And I wished that he had stuck with golf as a career instead of mountain climbing. <laughs> I didn't think it would, it would go to the lengths that it has gone. Mom and I have had a number of conversations about why it is that I climb. Well, she doesn't like me climbing, let's just be honest. Um, she's worried about me not coming back. I have to be honest, I had his funeral all planned. I just really felt he wouldn't come back. Sometimes people have said, okay, you made it sound that, you know, that it wasn't as difficult as I know it was. Tell me more about the drama and the extreme situations, the pain and on and on and on. In 1999, I was climbing with the youngest British climber ever to attempt the summit of Mount Everest. You know, it's um, it's over two years since uh, I was on top of Mount Everest the first time, and it was the same day as Michael Matthews. For every five summiteers, one person does not come back. Mike asked me if, if he should go for it, and I said, Mike, I uh, I can't tell you what to do. He got back to the tent. I looked up, couldn't see Mike. In fact, I looked up many, many times. I'm entirely hoping to see Mike and Mike. I never did. Sadly, in the unbelievable blinding snowstorm that followed later in the day, he was, he was lost on the mountain. It's not worth it. Somebody dies. He was 22. He had a guide on the trip, I didn't. He was separated from his guide. I was nowhere near him on the mountain at the time. There was nothing that I could do. I would have done anything to have gone up there and, and saved him if I could have. I didn't even find, find out until the next day. I'm so sorry. Mike. Although it was sweet to get to the top, it was incredibly bitter to come down knowing that a friend would be on the mountain forever. That's really the reason that I needed to go back this time. Going back to Everest was optional. I didn't have to go. But to exercise some of the demons I'd been possessed with, perhaps just a little bit, during my first successful attempt. So I guess I needed to prove that in addition to obtaining the high point. I needed to prove we could achieve not only the success of the summit, but also the safety of the members. Climbing Mount Everest is uh, a very dangerous activity, obviously, and may be considered very selfish in certain ways. Selfish because we can disallow the people close to us from being with them forever. Well, I think it may have been a little bit easier for me to be over there 
when you were here than for you to be here with me climbing the mountain. Mm -hmm. Because you didn't know exactly what I was up to, what kind of danger I might be in. I so I, I thought I'd be wanting to be with friends and family and that. Um, it was a really emotional time. It was hard on both of us. I think that I saw an emotional side of Dave that I hadn't seen before. We basically said everything that we wanted to say because there is the real possibility that he could not come back. I needed to tell him that no matter how far he made it on the mountain, I was proud of him for everything that he had done and he didn't need to prove anything to myself or anyone here at home. He just needed to climb with his head and his heart. My career started right here in Saskatchewan. <laughs> it's a perfect place. It's minus 40. There's snow and ice and wind. And all we do is take that horizontal horizon that we have, turn it vertical, and you've got Mount Everest. Just oh. suck out two thirds of the air. <laughs> it's a goal that you can't even see. It's so huge. It seems completely unattainable. How do you do it? My Everest education could be summed up in one word, and that is patience. Fear. I have to admit, the very first time I went across one of these ladders, I was deathly afraid. And it's an 8,000 foot fall one way, but lean, don't lean too far to the other direction because it's 10,000 feet the other way into Tibet. This is a section known as the Yellow Band. We're at about 25,000 feet above which we call the death zone. It's above this area where all of a sudden everything can go wrong. Altitude sickness can kick in. Circulatory systems, respiratory systems, digestive systems, the body just doesn't know what to do. It's a race against time. The body actually starts eating its own flesh, looking for the energy and oxygen that it, that it craves. I lost 35 pounds on this expedition, suffering from things like retinal hemorrhaging, uh, severe irritant bronchitis. I felt like a piece of glass about to shatter if I did anything wrong and uh, I have never been more mentally, physically, spiritually exhausted in my life. I wasn't going to let that stop me. Uh, camp 2 standing by. The base camp standing by. We got the call, I think it was about 8 in the morning, calling to say that the guys were leaving from Camp 4 to the summit at 10 o'clock. And it came in at about 10 to 3 in the morning that they had summited. You look up, and even though it's daytime, and the sun is brilliantly shining upon you, it's black because you're that close to outer space. You look down, and every corner of the world is bending beneath you. You actually see the curvature of the earth. And in the midst of this, you see a beautiful black pyramid, the summit of Everest, its shadow. I felt something welling up inside me. My heart was beating nice and strong, but nice and slow. I felt as if I was made to be there. And it was my moment. I knew there was no talking him out of it at all. I knew, I knew I couldn't. So what do you do? You love them through it. 